Welcome back to another episode of the Health Mastery Show. I'm your host, as per usual, Adam MacDonald. And in this episode, I have on with me Danny Lennon from Sigma Nutrition Radio. Now, Danny is probably one of the main reasons why I started this podcast. I've been listening to his podcast, Sigma Nutrition Radio, for multiple years. It's a great platform for people to learn about nutritional sciences, training, etc. It's very scientific-based and focused, but that's a really a key interest area of mine. Sigma Nutrition also specialize in coaching combat sport athletes, recreational athletes, as well as just general population clients. In this episode, we talk about Danny's holistic view of health and what that means. We also touch on the idea of metabolic flexibility. Is there anything you can do about that? And what does that mean for your overall health and well-being? So Danny is a really cool guy. I really enjoyed recording this episode. And if you do find it any way useful, please do check out some of his work, but also don't forget to leave a rating and review on iTunes because it does help. I know I always talk about this, but it does really help with the algorithms. We have all the timestamps in the show notes, as well as any kind of social media platforms that Danny has, his website, as well as my own. And if you want to contact me, please do just reach out to me with my email address or get me through Instagram. But with that being said, let's get into the podcast. Thanks for having me, Adam. It's, it's great to be here. So uh, thanks for asking me. Sure. Yeah. And you're actually my first Irish guest. I've, I think this is the, it's probably about the 10th episode that I recorded, but I'm probably going to publish this one next and it'll probably be the, like the fifth actual published episode. Great. I feel privileged to be able to, <laughs> hopefully I do the Irish crowd justice. Yeah. So um, I actually started the podcast as, as we spoke a little bit offline there just before because I've been listening to your podcast for such a long period of time, um, Sigma Nutrition Radio, I think it's, I don't know in terms of the rankings, but I would say at least in the evidence-based community, it's probably the top podcast in the world, I would say. I'm sure there's like other podcasts that are, you, you have a few others that are kind of fitness related, but a lot of them are like your Aubrey Marcus stuff where it's more just kind of bullshit. But I think yours is the, the one where you actually get these proper evidence-based practitioners and people who are doing research and people who have a bit of you know knowledge behind their behind their names and get them on the show so uh, yeah th- i really appreciate you coming on and thanks for the inspiration i guess oh very kind of you to say all those things and it's been certainly interesting for me to develop the show over this time and thankfully people care about this evidence-based stuff enough to continue to listen so it's it's pretty cool yeah, you can you can just send me the PayPal afterwards after the show. <laughs> but um, Danny, I, I wanted to talk about today. It's a little bit different because this whole podcast is a lot of it's based around natural bodybuilding and other things that pertain to that. But you had a really good episode. I can't remember when it was, but a couple of months ago, we talked specifically around health. So people kind of use the word health and and bodybuilding or weight training interchangeably, but it's not always necessarily the case. So would you please give your insight into what is health? Yeah, sure. And I think this can become quite a a deep topic to go through everything. But really, this was not anything um, that that is like beyond what other people have thought about. But it was really started from I sat down and tried to think, what is it? that we're talking about when we say we want to improve someone's health and particularly from the perspective of for anyone that's in a position as a practitioner either a nutritionist dietitian personal trainer strength coach doctor there's all these positions where we can work with people and generally we say we try and improve people's health and i just want to think about well well what is it do we really mean because sometimes that can be quite a narrow focus and and to some degree that makes sense because if we're a nutritionist or dietitian, for example, then of course our main focus why someone's coming is to do that through the means of nutrition. And we want to stay within our scope and not say we can do everything. But when we're in a position to help people, it's probably worth keeping in mind all the things that will relate to their health. So at least the way I started to conceptualize this, and, and this will probably change over time, and it was kind of just a very rough think through of, what well, what is it that we really mean by health? I kind of saw that there was a few distinct different categories we could talk about. We could talk about 
physical reality, uh, as I put it, which would be things like if you were to get a blood test and look at certain biomarkers, these are objective things that relate to your health. What is someone's blood glucose? What is their levels of free fatty acids in their blood? What is their blood pressure? And so on. We could look at things like their body composition, so how much fat mass, how much muscle mass do they have? How much relative strength do they have? Because again, that's a very important component related to uh, long-term health span and also if you look at mortality and, and comorbidities it's related to relative strength um, or, or even absolute strength in some ways and we can get into that and then movement capability so if someone is incapable of moving as they should be able to that in some way wouldn't be optimal health right and that's obviously not something that's available to everyone but if we can improve someone's health in some way then we can um, essentially be able to improve um, their overall health. Uh, then there's some other areas that all kind of blend in together that go beyond kind of someone's physical reality that might relate to more psychological and emotional health. Um, this would relate to things like what is their quality of the relationships with people around them. So those closest to them, their family, their spouse, their friends, people they work with, and then just other people in their wider community as well. And that kind of relates then into feelings of connectedness and social interaction, uh, like one of the biggest things we see as a risk factor um, for um, poor health outcomes later on in terms of like chronic disease risk and mortality is social isolation and loneliness. So how do we um, mitigate those and how do we keep a focus on social connection. Um, also seems that it's likely that having some sense of meaning and purpose is probably productive. And that again ties into broader emotional and psychological health um, issues like anxiety, depression, and so on. And that can be implicated in at least a certain percentage of those cases. And then on other psychological aspects might relate to uh, people's feeling of gratitude or an ability to have perspective of the good things they have, which is very easy for a lot of us to forget most of the time. Um, it also seems that ha having the perception of being needed and wanted is a really important uh, component for human health. And if we don't feel like we're needed or that we're loved or that we're wanted, that can have very uh, negative psychological consequences. And then there's this whole area of resilience. And this could be being resilience to negativity, which we can be surrounded by very easily, resilience to things like self doubt, uh, resilience to um, societal expectations. And all of these things are becoming more and more problematic, I guess, for, for several reasons. But one clear example that most people will know about is social media and how that can affect some of those things. And there's many other factors in there that I kind of got through, but that's kind of an overview of just trying to think through at least some different factors that in all those different ways impact our overall health. And the kind of punchline was if we only think about health in terms of changing body composition or doing activity and, and eating a certain way to improve our body composition, but we're doing certain behaviors at the expense of many of those other factors, then we're kind of missing out, right? And, and I think there's a way to do both. It's not that you have to pick one or the other, but it's being aware of, are your behaviors having a net positive impact on your health overall? And sometimes we can do things that, sure, might improve our physical health in some ways but not necessarily our overall health so that was kind of the idea behind that whole thought process and like i said it's still evolving but um hopefully that gives kind of some uh starting off point of, of where i was thinking about it yeah i think it's a it's a very mature kind of thought process in terms of what health is because like you said when when somebody even thinks of you know i focus on health or i'm a health coach the first thing you'll think of is, oh, okay, you know, what should I eat or what kind of exercise should I do? But I always had this rhetorical question that I would ask myself as you do with rhetorical questions, but I, I never really, I suppose I didn't really publish this or publicize my thoughts on this because I don't think it's a necessity. Like you said, you don't have to just focus on one facet of health, but I would rather be, and I'm not 
blowing my own trumpet here but i'm in pretty good shape i mean i'm competing in a few weeks so in relative mm. terms i people would say that i i look healthy i wouldn't say i'm at optimal health but in terms of body composition i have been focusing on that for a long time but i always felt that if i had to choose i would rather be obese and have health consequences as a result of that but be extremely content and mentally um healthy i won't say happy because that's not necessarily the only thing that constitutes mental health is just being happy all the time but i think i'd rather be like that than to be in great shape and then suffer from mental health problems because i feel that they're just a lot more I, I suppose they can have a lot more negative impacts. So, uh, it's it's hard to say, it's hard to quantify, but I think from having suffered from anxiety sometimes and bouts of depression, like most people will at some stage, mm. that it's a lot worse than um, certain physical health problems. And, and although the both can be awful and eventually both can lead to your death, I think that just being mentally in a good place is more important for me. Or I think I'd rather live that way than the op- the opposite way i don't think people like when it when it comes to things like suicide like people uh, well i don't think people will commit suicide because they're you know they're really overweight and i'm sure that has been the case but i think it's it's more related to mental health problems rather than physical health problems yeah i i would i would agree with that sentiment that really if you have this feeling of being in poor Um, emotional or psychological health and obviously that's a huge gamut of different issues but if if you are in a position where that is is the case uh, almost nothing else with your physical kind of reality matters right you can be in the best shape possible you could be really strong you could be doing whatever and but it, it almost doesn't matter um where as you say if we if we talk just about body composition for example then um on one side actually body composition doesn't directly predict um on an individual basis someone's actual health status so that we can have people who are technically obese but are actually in good metabolic health or are uh, relatively healthy and are uh, not developing any chronic diseases at, at least for a certain uh, period of time and that's a whole other issue we, we can get into but even beyond that there's the probably the, one of the most damaging things about being in even in poor physical health is the impact it has on you psychologically psychologically right and it's that's the the i would say the most damaging aspect to that so uh, it's hard to completely separate them out because again if someone has a certain uh, disease or disorder or gets a certain diagnosis that's uh, of a physical um, nature that is going to impact them psychologically and vice versa so it, it's hard to separate physiological and psychological completely um, but I would agree with you if we're thinking about what is true health over the long term I think you've got to put emotional health kind of at the center of that piece so if somebody was coming to you and you're a coach correct me if I'm wrong yes yeah, so you coach I- for Sigma Nutrition uh, at the moment, I have I don't coach. Uh, I've been coaching for a number of years, and over the last probably uh, two years, I've cut that down to zero, which was kind of the plan. And we have four other amazing coaches that do all the coaching, so I'm just left to the content production right now. You're you're like one of those uh, YouTubers who does online coaching for five thousand clients and outsources it to India or something like that. <laughs> I wish I was. I'd be making uh, big bucks then, but yeah, no, unfortunately, nine dollars a month for a one-to-one online coach. <laughs> but um, no, so if, if someone was coming to you to improve their health, you kind of mentioned a couple of pillars or four or five pillars that you would look at, and would you feel like it's in your scope? of practice or your ability to be able to at least influence all those areas and is that something that you do look at or do you simply focus on the kind of the nutrition and the training aspect because i'm sure your methodologies and thought processes have evolved over time sure and and so if someone is coming to us um to typically it's to uh, work on their nutrition um most of our 
coaching is nutrition coaching and we do have training available with that but the majority of the people are coming directly for nutrition so that's the lens we're going to start working someone with um but over time as that client uh, coach relationship develops and there's a greater sense of trust then the discussions during consultations are where you can work out what's going on with someone and so i mean everyone will know that if there's something significant going on in your life at the moment and there's like a significant trauma that's recently happened or you have a huge amount of stress or someone in, is dealing with some degree of um, anxiety or depression or, or any um, issue that is consuming their uh, mental energy then it's very difficult to really care that much a, a lot of the time about things like nutrition decisions or training and it it kind of worked both ways right so eating better and being more active and being doing exercise can help um but at the same time we need to recognize in some cases depending on uh, what someone is going through that might not even be an option it might not be doable and so if we only care about giving someone recommendations of what to eat and how to exercise but we're not really looking at well is there anything influencing why they're not able to do this right now or why they're not responding or why they still don't feel good then we can get to that through conversation so most of that is again through uh, the human element of coaching and it it's it's a difficult one because i think it needs to come from a place where the client is uh, feels that they can open up and talk about this stuff and that may not be for a significant period of time and maybe w with the coach directly it may not be that person that they can really talk about stuff but if we can through questions understand that they're going through something and encourage them to either talk to someone at least or we can be that person they can just bounce something off then we're at least acknowledging that um, that can be an issue. So I think it's it's that human element of coaching that we try and work that through. Um, but it's going to depend on each particular case. And uh, as you can probably imagine, it, it depends on what we're specifically talking about. If it goes beyond our scope, so if there's a true um, issue that they should seek professional help with, then we can happily refer or recommend that they do so we can't force them to do anything but if it's something where they're just going through a particular stressful period then we can acknowledge that and maybe that will influence some of the nutrition and training recommendations we're making to allow for that but also be able to um just feel let them know that they're being heard and that we understand yeah completely agree so I suppose if somebody was coming to you with a, a goal of, of fat loss just and they want to, and I'm sure this is what you often get on your intake form or whatever way you kind of screen people would be, I want to lose fat and I want to improve my health because we're in a kind of a, a, an obesogenic society. The environment's not great for body composition and health in general. And people seem to be just stressed out because of jobs or, or work or whatever it is. I'm not going to say they're more stressed out than we were in the past i'm sure people just had different problems in the past but that seems to be a typical case of someone that i would work with stress seems to be quite high whether it's from relationships whether it's from financial stress work whatever that may be what would you look at in that kind of scenario in terms of oh, i'm trying to improve this person's health and maybe they're not suffering from you know crazy psychological problems or they don't have severe depression that needs to be um outsourced or to be referred out but just your typical person who will you know have their ups and downs what would you look at doing there in terms of the, those pillars that you mentioned instead of just saying well here's the nutrition plan that you follow or here's the training plan what what would you start to do sure i think a lot of this can be done through uh, the right type of questioning through asking good targeted open-ended questions even for uh, that person to ponder on for a while themselves and so for example a lot of people will come with certain assumptions about why they want to start getting coaching that may or may not necessarily be accurate 
and the most obvious one that I'm, I'm sure you would have probably seen with people as well is people will come because they feel oh, if I get some coaching and I lose a certain amount of weight, then that's what will make me happy. And right now I'm unhappy. And first we kind of should probably challenge that assumption that weight loss is something that inherently is going to make you happy. And, and sure, we can acknowledge that for a lot of people, it's quite positive change in their life, that they're getting more active, they change their diet, they feel better. If they start to change their body composition, they feel more confident. All those things are very positive for a lot of people. But I'm sure you know a lot of people as well who have um, gone on a diet, lost weight, and then realized it wasn't this panacea they thought it was going to be. And they, they thought it was going to take away or give them some sort of feeling that everything is, is great and it wasn't all it cracked up to be. And so just getting them thinking about why they have certain goals, is that actually true? And what is it that they are, are really trying to change? Because the a surface goal of I want to lose X amount of kilos is is fine to start but it's not really anyone's goal it's what they think that's going to give them so by drilling down into what they suspect will happen if they were to achieve that goal that's the real things we're targeting so if for someone it's feeling a bit more confident that's that's one thing that that we realize that's the actual goal for someone else if it's the ability to play with their grandkids that they can't currently do because they'll be out of breath or that they can't move something like that then we're looking at these real goals that are going to be able to get more leverage on someone than this kind of surface goal that's always centered around uh, weight loss and then the other thing is to kind of challenge has their have their goals been influenced by things within our culture and society that makes them feel that they're not enough right now and they need to change who they are in a certain way um and all that sounds like i've just listed it over a matter of a couple of minutes but that could take a significant period of time to to work through and you don't just dump all of that in one go but they're the types of routes that initially over um a number of weeks we can work with someone to just get them thinking about those things um and then that kind of opens up this whole area around let's say if it is someone that is um wanted to become uh, more confident or they're not feeling good right now and they think that losing some weight is going to help with that then we can start to see well is there other things that they can do whilst they're working on this body comp composition stuff to still be happy like we don't want someone to have the uh, this this narrative repeated that you can only be happy when you achieve a certain amount of weight loss or change your body comp composition a certain way and we want to detach the idea that, that that has anything really to do with their identity and their self-worth so if we can do that from the start then we can get someone into a more positive position and then the end goal ends up being what it is after a while but it's almost um secondary to some of those mindset uh, mindset shifts yeah i i actually talked with somebody else on this recently and it was kind of a a question of well exercise and fat loss for a certain group of people does improve your health so you know there's a lot of research to show that that can improve your health but to an extent or to a, at a certain point it actually starts to have a a negative impact where especially if somebody wants to get like say very lean or like say a male sub 10 percent body fat it starts to have not just on a physiological aspects but you know sociological and psychological aspects as well that's to go in the opposite direction and make your health actually worse and i did experience this myself um i think it might be in 2012 or 13 i remember i was on erasmus in france and i was into lifting big time and always kind of tracked my food or was you know cognizant of what i ate but i was a lot of drinking and as you do eating out and stuff as you're on holiday enjoying it or holiday i should say i should say college but um yeah i got kind of i won't say fat but i got pretty heavy and i always had the idea of competing in, in bodybuilding so I, I competed as soon as i got home from that year i was like well a bit self-conscious because people know me as the kind of guy who's in shape and stuff but i was fairly heavy in terms of body fat and i was like when i compete i'm gonna i'm gonna be like 
get so much um you know notice in terms of my social circles it's going to help me with girls and i'm going to have so much more self-confidence and i went through this really really hard prep i lost around 40 pounds of body body fat or probably muscle as well but it was the first time i did a long cut and i remember i competed and it was good and people t- told me how good i looked and then like a week later after i had like binged my way back to like <laughs> you know m- mid-teen body fat i realized that like oh I d- this didn't this wasn't cut out to what i thought it was going to be you know mm. i i'm not in any better position i actually went out significantly less with my friends um because in the irish culture you know in college you drink and stuff i, I cut that out especially as i was coming towards the end of the competition i my my testosterone was low i actually got a test and i was feeling the mental f- effects of that with some depressive symptoms i had that post contest blues and i was actually in a much worse position after and then when I started and what I thought I would get, I didn't get at all. And it was like mm-hmm. almost the opposite effect. And I do see that, especially with social media, you have guys who are like, they're good looking guys. They're, they have good genetics. They're, they're lean year round. They have good insertions, muscle bellies. They look muscular. They've got the cars, they've got money. They're probably YouTubers and I'll get guys who are young and they'll come to me saying, I want to do this. Like, christian guzman 90 day challenge where i get shredded and uh and compete on stage and it's like well you haven't successfully been able to get below 15 percent body fat ever because you have food relationship issues and they can tell that there's an underlying thinking that that's going to get them confidence it's going to get them uh social status or whatever and i suppose it's hard as a as a coach to because in, in a way that's kind of often what what you're selling at least when i'm doing let's say physique coaching i am ultimately selling the physique but it's hard when somebody comes to say well this is what i want to get and when i ask them you know why is i want to get ripped or i want to get shredded and especially for young men it's hard to get them to really voice what it is that's driving that and then to say well that's not really going to get you the the answer um because Mm -hmm. almost feels like you're driving them away for what you're actually putting out if that makes sense yeah it totally does and i think bodybuilding is the perfect example because number one of the extremes you have to go to but also i think the influence of social media over the last number of years in terms of people who want to get involved in the sport and it's something i've talked about with with people who are involved deeply in bodybuilding um over a while that probably going back um years before there was this in, this i suppose increased participation due to social media um people that were getting involved with bodybuilding it was very much at least to me in, in a lot of cases probably more intrinsically driven for people who love the sport of bodybuilding and seeing it as that as, as a sport right i'm preparing for this day where i'm going to go out and showcase this physique i've built but and do it in a way that i'm competing and i'm executing on stage on that day whereas i think now as you allude to there's many people that are getting involved with the idea of coming to a a prep coach and saying hey i want to do a contest prep but i don't think they really care that much about say the sport of bodybuilding or physique or whatever they're going into they're doing it for alternative reasons and i think that is in a lot of cases a mistake because of just what it takes to actually go through a, mm. a contest prep and, and, and compete. And it's almost like people are, are using it as, well, if I commit to doing this contest prep, then I'll get in really good shape and I'll have these photos to put up. And then people are thinking it's all nice. And it's, it's very ex- extrinsically driven. And it's I think it's a, a large number of people that are starting to compete now. Um, and I think maybe a lot of them don't realize, well, l- like you said, right? If someone does just want to look generally good and they want to be able to, I don't know, whatever, they're, they're a young guy and they want to be able to walk around with a shirt off or uh, at the beach or whatever it is, that's all fine. I have no problem with it. But you could, they could do that at like 12% body fat and it'd be fine. But this um, idea of using bodybuilding or, or doing a contest prep as a means of addressing some other um factors that are extrinsically driven i'm not sure is the best idea and i think the people who can compete in bodybuilding and don't succumb to the many potential negatives psychologically that can arise from that 
are those people who see it as something they do for themselves, for the love of an actual sport, and they view bodybuilding as a sport that they compete in as an athlete and are doing it for their own internal reasons as opposed to these others. I think if it's done extrinsically, I think those people are more susceptible to the many um, psychological uh, negatives that can come from and are at least related to and it, it which way they come is or which way they occur is, is another question but uh, at least are associated with um, competing in a physique based sport like that yeah and I think that's probably one of the reasons why I like natural bodybuilding as well especially as I've gotten I suppose more mature when when I was younger I, I wanted to be like the men's physique etc and the thing that about natural bodybuilding is it takes so long to actually progress or to make changes over time even from competition to competition and you touched on a little bit when you talked about health and having something to strive for or having meaning or having a goal so for me it's not necessarily about actually achieving the end result so i know that if i want to do well let's say just the last weekend there was um the the uk finals on and the guy who won it was uh, um, Dr. Andrew Chapel from yep. from Scotland. Yep. And he, I would have been in a similar weight class. Well, I would have been in his weight class and actually got invited to go, but I didn't go because I'm, I'm waiting out. But I know that he's got a lot more muscle than me. But for me, that's I'm excited because that's something I can strive for over many, many years rather than saying, well, I want to get to that in you know, six months' time because I know that getting there isn't actually what's going to bring me happiness it's actually the the process of yes of, of, of trying to achieve that so when when you spoke about it originally at the start of this podcast it kind of you had an air of jordan peterson off you where you're striving for meaning and not just trying to get a goal but actually the act of trying to reach a goal is what brings you you know happiness or or, or fulfillment rather than I achieved it, so now I'm happy, if right. that makes sense. A- absolutely. But, and I think everyone has heard that thing, right, of the process is more important than the end outcome. But we so rarely apply that logic to ourselves in, in many of our own goals. We don't really deeply think through it. And this is the exact example of it. it it's um, particularly with bodybuilding, any of those people I was referring to a moment ago of the people that have longevity in the sport that seem to be able to do this thing that is really, really difficult and has all these potential risks with it, but come out of it relatively unscathed in the long term uh, psychologically are those that do it for not only the love of the sport and the competing, but genuinely love that process of working on themselves for day in, day out for over a long period of time, as opposed to I'm putting myself through this so I can look a certain way or be able to get certain photos done or what other people will think of me. It's, it's again, it's that intrinsic thing of loving that process and that slow, gradual grind, um, particularly when you're talking about natural bodybuilding of how these small little changes that are probably for the vast majority of people that are not in bodybuilding are not really noticeable so you have to have that mindset of it being intrinsically driven i'm guessing and um yeah that makes total sense to me yeah and it also covers off the topic of you talked a little bit about resilience as part of overall health i suppose in the the psychological uh, aspect and I've been big into stoicism over the last couple of years, and I, uh, you've obviously heard of stoicism. I'm not sure if you yep. practice any stoicism actively, but I think it's it's my kind of form of stoicism before, and I think I mentioned that because you have to endure self-inflicted <laughs> suffering. It sounds a bit weird. It sounds like like I'm um, uh, like masochism or something, <laughs> but um, you, but like dieting and doing cardio, not with the the goal of oh, I can't wait till this is done so I can get the photos or get the the trophy. And that's why when people ask me, like, why do you do it for a plastic trophy? Or why do you do it to get tanned up on stage to flex your muscles? It's They don't understand the, the, the thought process of what goes into it. And for me, it's my form of active stoicism. And I know that it will carry over into other areas. So me pushing myself through this, even though I know I can make an easier choice, I can, I can eat food. I, I was doing cardio right before we got on this I went for some steps, and um, I know I didn't have to do that. I could have, and could have eaten some food that's in the mm. breast because I was pretty hungry. But I actively pursue difficulty so that it, it 
basically makes me more resilient for when we will ultimately have to to suffer um because at some point we will have to suffer um mm. the, out of not ever out of our own choice but things just ha- come up in life and that's kind of why i touched on the bit of we don't always want to just strive for happiness as well because there's going to be times when you can't be happy then what happens then you know right. you don't there's no meaning to life um i think we're going a little bit off topic here but um it, it's a good conversation nonetheless mm-hmm. but to, to bring it back to health when when you're looking at someone let's say for physical health are there specific markers that you will try and improve upon for certain people or do you look at body composition from the physical aspect yeah so initially um it it will of course depend on the individual working with and you can probably get a fair idea of if there's so, so the metrics we track will differ from uh client to client and we can change those based on who they are their background what their goals are etc so some of the um it's probably most common ones we would probably track body weight with a decent uh, I, I would say a, a large majority of our clients um, we work with for example a lot of power lifters so with them we obviously need to track body weight because they're competing in a weight class based sport um, a lot of times even for people who are changing their body composition the most easy metric particularly if we're coaching them in an online fashion is to track body weight and if we know that they're doing resistance training and eating a high protein diet then we can be fairly sure that if we see changes in body weight it's mainly reflecting uh, fat mass change uh, at least if we take that over say the trends over many weeks so we'll look at body weight in a number of people again there are exceptions there are people who it might be contraindicated for depending on their background if we suspect it would be a psychological negative for this person to track body weight we won't use that we can use many other markers related to certain behaviors they may have instead Um, in terms of specific uh, physical things like if you're talking about like blood tests or so on um, if someone has had access to that sure we can look at it but we don't demand all our clients to go and get a certain battery of tests done Um, if they are reporting certain symptoms and we refer them to someone then obviously we can take a look at that stuff if they are let's say a a diabetic then we're obviously going to have data on their blood glucose and we can look at responses to certain meals but we we don't have a set battery of of blood tests we require people to look through so again it's more on a case-by-case basis so some of the physical if we're talking like um objective markers uh would be those and then we have a whole host of more subjective um actually a mix of subjective and objective things but they're not related to blood tests or physical markers per se it might be things like duration of sleep number of steps and and so on but we can you can get into that if you want um so yeah yeah i understand and then when it comes to the other areas of health i suppose it's probably a little bit more difficult to objectively track those things with clients that you work with or is that something that you can do do you get them to rate their stress or their their social their mental well-being or or anything like that yeah we do use quite a fair few subjective markers and we try and mix that with the objective markers as well but i think many um, of the subjective markers are actually pretty useful so for example um, if you look at data around predicting um, risk of injury the subjective markers in that can actually be even more informative a lot of the time than any objective markers per se so we will use a mix of things so like i said common ones that we would use that we get people to track could be number of hours spent in bed Um, we might look at typical sleep time sleep and wake times and how regular they are we might be things like how many um, minutes uh, walk we wanted someone to do it could be number of steps they do in a given day it could be uh, we have a like a, again like you say a stress number so one to five what they might rate their stress as um, something about their freshness we will get them to rate their motivation to train um, all these things can give us important data that we don't make massive decisions based off one but if we certainly see a few of those markers and and, uh, for a number of days or trends going in a certain direction we can see that something might need to be changed and usually then that 
afterwards ends up getting reflected in other measures. So, um, yeah, we, we do rely on quite a few subjective markers. And I think it also has the other benefit of getting clients just to be more aware about what's going on that kind of they're they're thinking about what they're doing each day when they're rating some of these these markers and then you can also see improvements over time if their mood state is better over a number of weeks that's obviously a massive win if they're feeling fresher whatever that means to them again that's a, a big win uh, regardless of how let's say necessarily accurate is from one person to the next is almost irrelevant. We're looking at for this one individual, how is their subjective feelings of things changing? Yeah, I guess everything that you measured starts to kind of paint a picture and that will ultimately dictate how you alter their training, like you said, or their, their nutrition. Right. Yeah. And, and so it's really useful for predicting. Um, like if we start to see, let's say someone's motivation for tr to train goes right down their mood is a bit down, they're reporting that they're feeling just generally tired all the time. And then we start to look at, then we can match that up with their objective training data. So you might see in their training log that the RPEs for certain sets are higher than we might have thought, or they're going up over time, or <clears throat> the number of reps they get in an AMRAP is down compared to the previous week. So it starts to make sense. It's like, oh yeah, th th we maybe, they might need to do a deload, or maybe they're not, taking care of their nutrition properly, maybe their sleep is off. So we can start to work out why are we seeing these changes? Because it doesn't immediately tell us why, but then we investigate further and we can, because we've collected all this data, we can match up what is the reason for their performance dipping down? Is it their sleep? Is it their nutrition? Is it that they've just accumulated too much fatigue and they need a deload? We can start working those out through that mix of, of data. Mm, very good. And do you have any general recommendations for overall improvement of health that you will give clients initially so because you don't just specifically say focus on composition or body weight do you give them recommendations in terms of perhaps you should do some journaling or some meditation or these kind of things again that tends to probably be a bit more individualized on what we think like i have my own biases of, of stuff i think is really useful um, but i try and not have a broad blanket recommendation um, i also try and let our coaches have quite a lot of autonomy and what they feel is needed for each of their clients they're working with as opposed to being a top-down thing from me um, so i have complete faith in what our coaches may decide for someone that they are getting to know uh, and can use their judgment on um, but initially the nutrition side it we are looking at getting people a, a good solid structure um, seeing what they're actually doing themselves and seeing where the bottleneck is to their progress beyond the, the nutrition stuff probably the one that we most consistently really place a lot of emphasis on early on is sleep uh, it's just something that profoundly affects everything else we're trying to do and with i think some relatively straightforward changes and awareness brought to it it's something that we can at least improve a small amount in most people and then the, the benefit they feel from that is quite large so the return on investment for modifying someone's sleep is pretty large so that would be the first port of call that I would go to outside of the nutrition stuff would probably be sleep. If we're more talking about the emotional and psychological um, stuff, I think where I would probably recommend people to look at is um, social connection. So I, I was doing a seminar or a talk at a conference recently um, talking about this concept of how we can modify what metrics we track with different people. And one example I gave was that instead of tracking a certain, um, let's say, activity or number of steps or so on, there could be some people where it might be perfectly reasonable that what we're going to track with this individual this week is how the number of social, social interactions they have with a close friend or a family member and get them to actively put them into the schedule. If they are reporting to us that, yeah, I don't really see people, I'm super busy all the time, I've been putting it off, can we put that somewhere in that they're actively trying to take care of that? So, um, and, and I think it's something that we all easily lose track on. Like I, I know even personally myself because all my work is online and I find it very easy just to continue doing quite a lot of work and I, I don't mind 
my own company, I guess, that I can let that slip sometimes. So over, I would say the last um, six months to a year, I've been really cognizant of really every week making a, a set plan and a commitment to social interactions and really working on those social connections and really being present in those moments and taking that as seriously as I would take a training session, if not more seriously. So Mm -hmm. that would be one that I think people could consider at least. Um, Not everyone needs to do it, but I think that would be one interesting one to, Mm -hmm. to track more meticulously. Three sets of phone calls at the end of the training <laughs> right. session. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pro- progressive phone call overload. Now, this week you have to make seven phone calls, uh, and know, then man. and the, then we deload afterwards. We just don't talk to anybody. Man, I, I could write a, a whole thing about this now. You've got a great idea for me. This could be the thing to revolutionize things. <laughs> you, you never know. It actually probably would work if you actively got people to actively reach out to more right. people on a right, weekly yeah. basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I don't know how how well that would fly. Um, <laughs> but. With regards to then going back to health and specifically metabolic health, and I know we talked a little bit about this before we jumped online, was the idea of metabolic flexibility. Now, for those who don't understand, my understanding of metabolic flexibility is your body's ability to be able to switch uh, through different energy substrates. So basically from oxidizing fat to oxidizing carbohydrates. And we know that in insulin resistant people so people with type 2 diabetes or they're not able to basically efficiently use carbohydrates but there has been some i suppose i have seen it online and i've actually uh, heard a few uh, quite well-renowned people talking about the idea that we can improve our metabolic flexibility and that will inc- improve our energy so we will often hear people saying well i don't do well with fats and we know that is to be true some people just seem to do better whatever that means with more carbohydrates versus fats but do you think that this is a this ha- has any real world application to people who aren't let's say metabolically unhealthy so people who don't have type 2 diabetes um and can we apply that to ourselves in terms of different strategies to improve our body's ability to use different energy substrates so basically burn more fat or oxidize more fat as we just do more aerobic activity like just sitting here recording a podcast Mm. and then be more efficient at using carbohydrates when we want to use them yeah so i think as a general heuristic and a general rule of thumb, it's better to be metabolically flexible than metabolically inflexible. Now, to try and piece that apart, like you say, we're talking about this ability to switch between different fuel substrates, and primarily here we're, we're talking about um, oxidation of fat or oxidation of carbohydrate, so fat burning, carbohydrate burning. And so if we're talking about what is metabolic inflexibility, so if someone isn't metabolically flexible that can happen in kind of one or two ends of that spectrum as you say in the case of something like insulin resistance we have this metabolic inflexibility towards glucose right but we can also have a metabolic inflexibility towards fat and this would be where we have something like mitochondrial dysfunction right so someone isn't able to oxidize fat in um at the at the times and in the manner they should and so what we're uh, looking at then is if someone is in metabolically inflexible, they're almost kind of stuck at one end of that spectrum. Um, typically at the, the the higher end where they're oxidizing, say, too much carbohydrate at rest is, is pretty common. And they're not able to use fat when they should, i.e. at rest. So they're burning carbohydrates all the time. So if the question is, is there a... Um, is there, is it worth targeting that? I think the things you would do to target or improve someone's metabolic flexibility are all things we'd probably uh, be doing or, or, or it'd probably be part of an overall healthy um, program anyway in terms of generally being leaner is going to make someone more metabolically uh, flexible. Also doing some degree, let's say, of um, aerobic work will again lead to mitochondrial biogenesis or generation of mitochondria. So again, you will have better fat oxidation ability. I think being able to um, essentially train yourself to 
burn fat or oxidize fat more efficiently is generally a good thing um for so if we take it from an athlete perspective then theoretically we can get them oxidizing more fat at slightly higher exercise intensities and i think it's probably uh, better to encourage that when we are at rest that we are using uh, fat oxidation primarily um, instead of someone that's burning too much carbohydrate um so that we, we could talk about some of the results of someone being metabolically inflexible and, and why that that matters but to from an overview level to answer your question i, I do think that it it matters so I, I think it's good to be metabolically flexible in terms of um how prevalent that is in people who are let's say quote unquote healthy again i think there are people who can be perfectly lean and still be metabolically inflexible but in general you would see that people who are active um have a lean body composition engage in exercise that they're typically metabolically uh, flexible yeah so that that would be my kind of question would be that we we kind of start to see people improving their overall metabolic health as they get leaner to a certain point if they're say overweight or obese so are we kind of putting the the cart before the horse and trying to fix something that will be fixed simply by losing body fat or can we actually improve on our metabolic flexibility by actively trying to specifically work on our metabolic flexibility so let's say you or i who are not necessarily overweight can we improve our metabolic flexibility and then what would that even mean like uh, from a, a let's say we're not like team sky cyclists and we want to improve our our sprint but we are just generally generally trying to improve our health and how we feel do you think that would have any implications if we can actually do anything about that so i, I think in, in those cases it would have to be someone let's say that is um although there are let's say uh, in a have a lean body composition but let's say they eat a large amount of carbohydrates at every meal all day long every single day then you could probably make the case that their ability to oxidize fat isn't as good as it could be and they could benefit from having at least some periods where there is a uh, slightly less carbohydrate um, that they're ingesting um, and that would be kind of periodized across the week or off across a day and they're being able to make themselves tap into increasing fat oxidation instead of constantly oxidizing carbohydrate all the time i think that would have um some uh, distinct benefit so I, I think um one of the things that would happen is again if so if, if we have someone who is metabolically inflexible um you have problems then in response to eating a certain meal if they're not able to switch from let's say um fatty acid release to fatty acid storage after a meal right um so there and then, and then there's other things that go on in terms of glucose metabolism that we can get into but i think that if someone is in that position where they're just eating a high amount of carbohydrate at every meal all day every day um and doing that especially with a high meal frequency there's probably going to be some benefit to and not doing that and having some periods of time where you are not con continuously doing so if that makes sense yeah it does so you'd either recommend some periods where you're either doing a, a more higher fat approach or potentially even fasting i know that you talked to uh, mike t nelson on this he's a pretty big advocate of some periods of fasting to improve metabolic health yeah so i, I think the whole fasting area is quite complex and we'd have to piece apart different types of fasting models and exactly what's going on but we do see with a lot of the different fasting interventions um benefits for uh metabolic health and it, like one of the big things that i have uh i would generally be a fan of is say time restricted feeding where we aren't consistently eating from the moment we get up until the moment we go to bed but we have a condensed feeding window now we don't know exactly what that needs to be and it's probably different for different people but having at least some periods of times where we're tapping into let's say that 
quote unquote fasting physiology, I think is generally a good thing or even more so just the ability to do that is probably a good sign. If someone isn't able to do that, that's kind of one of the signs of them being metabolically inflexible that they will find it very difficult to go for any real length of time without having to have a meal. So I think it could be periods of fasting, but like you say, it could just mean that, okay, at certain meals, we're just not going to have like a uh, super high carbohydrate intake, right? Um, mm. now, now, the other thing to be aware of is for some people, it might not matter as much. And there's certain cases where you can induce metabolic inflexibility, but that's just a normal adaptation. So for example, if someone goes on a ketogenic diet, they are essentially making themselves insulin resistant. However, that's a kind of transient insulin resistance that's a normal adaptation to a ketogenic diet that is not the same thing as pathophysiological insulin resistance. So if we think about what's happening in a ketogenic diet, you have no real exogenous glucose coming in or very little. Your brain is still using glucose. And so your body is going to try and spare what glucose it is, uh, is in the bloodstream and what it is uh, producing from the liver, that that is going to serve the brain. So it doesn't want your muscles and other tissues around the body taking up that glucose that's kind of trying to keep for the brain because there's very little of it around. So it would make sense to make your muscles insulin resistant so they're not taking up that glucose and therefore it can make its way to the brain. So that's a kind of transient insulin resistance that happens in response to a ketogenic diet. That's a normal adaptation. So there's one example where we can have a a metabolically inflexible state um, that is a kind of adaptation to that type of dietary intervention. So it can work in both of those ways. So it's not just that low carb, high fat is um, eating is what people should be doing to increase their metabolic flexibility. In fact, if you take it to the extreme of low carb, high fat eating, that's just inducing metabolic inflexibility at the other end. So um, it's it kind of gets... Um, it, it depends on the specifics of the situation, but I think being able to oxidize meals that are, have uh, fat and also be able to oxidize meals that have carbohydrate is a good sign of metabolic health. And if someone's not able to do either one of those things, it's probably a sign that something is up metabolically. And finally, how would somebody know if they're not able to do that? Would that be sluggishness or severe hunger if you go for periods without carbohydrates? Yeah, so there's a few things you can look at. So, um, for example, um, if someone is metabolically inflexible, we uh, let's say they have a um, meal of a high amount of carbohydrate and they are... So, so one example here that I talk about with the ketogenic diet is, again, if you induce that type of metabolic inflexibility and then you have a... Um, high carbohydrate meal in that state, you are going to have a greater glucose excursion to that meal after that than you otherwise would if you hadn't been on that ketogenic diet and you'd been consuming carbohydrates uh, because because you're you don't have the ability to oxidize it that at that time. And so that's um, just something to bear in mind um, when people are either coming off a ketogenic diet or if they're doing a cyclical ketogenic diet or anything like that, that you will get a, a worse blood glucose response. In terms of how people would notice that, uh, it's hard to give exact symptoms because again, they're quite generic and could relate to many things. So like if we say uh, sluggishness or something like that, that could be many different things. It's not really that instructive. And I think a lot of time people might um, nocebo themselves into diagnosing themselves with some of uh, of this um so it'd be i mean you could look at your blood glucose response to meals to see if you are um effectively dealing with uh, meals appropriately in terms of um oxidizing uh, and metabolizing those meals but um again it's more uh, a look at just uh what what's going on from a uh, pr probably kind of predicting is probably the, the better way of looking what way it's set up and then thinking how could we um, have a, a setup where you're not just either continually oxidizing carbohydrate or just continually oxidizing fat. How can we have a mix of two and not really worry about the diagnostic tools because for, for an individual, 
it's probably not going to be as accurate as what you would do in a, a lab, for example. Yeah, it's a very interesting topic, uh, fasting, metabolic flexibility. And I, I would really like to see some research in the future into the kind of trade-offs or even benefits of fasting, but then with somebody who also has a goal of maximizing muscle protein synthesis and do long periods of fasting actually improve that because maybe of some autophagy or something like that, or would they impair that because of less frequent protein feedings? Um, but I, I guess that'll be a while probably before we see specific studies um, into that kind of thing. But finally, mm. Danny, I have one question for you to wrap up because we're almost coming up on time. And I often hear you ask this, people. So just for this episode, I'm going to ask you, what one piece of advice would you give somebody to in some way improve their life? Um, you probably don't have it. So. It's, it's something I changed my mind on quite a lot. So that's why uh, I find it difficult Fasting. to answer. <laughs> what, what, I'll, what I'll go for now is is something i think is um to do something that that to be, that benefits someone else in a selfless manner so whether people want to call that an active uh or a random act of kindness or whether it's just messaging someone you know to tell them that you uh, appreciate them or that what they do is good or um, even saying to a family member or a parent how much you appreciate what they've done um, or anything that makes someone else feel good is like the ultimate way to make yourself feel good so i would think if you don't know what to do then try and fit that into your day um, just say something nice to someone and uh, you'll you'll probably immediately start to feel a bit better Oh, that's a great piece of advice and if somebody doesn't know what to do they could probably just leave a review on this podcast that would be <laughs> there we go nice. there's a nice thing <laughs> for the day but uh thanks a lot danny for coming on so where can people find more information about you your work and get in touch with you if if they want to sure so the probably the easiest place is the website just sigma nutrition.com they can find everything there um, if they want to find the podcast, it's just Sigma Nutrition Radio on any podcast app. And then they can find me on social media. Just type in my name to any of social media sites and they should be able to find me. Um, Instagram, my handle is Danny Lennon underscore Sigma. And uh, yeah, any of those places, I'm happy to answer any questions or anything I can help with. So that was a great session with Danny Lennon. I think the key takeaway is that your health should be looked at from perspective of multiple pillars. Let's say your health or your overall well-being is like a table. Your physical health, body composition and muscle and body fat percentage, that's going to be one chair or one leg, I should say, on the table. But it's not the only leg. So there's other pillars that, that are important as well. It's things like your social well-being, the social interactions that you have with people your mental health which is arguably more important but I think when you're looking at your overall health you should take it from a holistic perspective and you know give adequate time or proportionally equal amounts of time to other areas of your health rather than just focusing on your physical look or physical performance and that is ultimately what health is going to be about so if you have any feedback or any questions please do drop me an email or send me an Instagram DM, whatever it is, as well as leaving a review on iTunes or whatever podcast platform you're on because the more popular the podcast is, the more popular guests that I can get on. And if you do want to check out any of Danny's work as well, you can get him or Sigma Nutrition. All of their details are in the show notes as well. And finally, I want to just say thank you so much for listening to the end if you've got this far. And I look forward to chatting with you in future episodes where we have many, many more guests who are going to bring you some great value.